Well, hello again guys. Here we are for another installment. This one is about niches and community interactions. If you were to ask someone where an organism lives, the response might be something like in the bayou or in an oak tree. That's like saying you live in Katy or Sugarland or Texas. This gives the listener information about location, but not much else. Ecologists need more information. They want to understand fully why an organism lives where it does and how it fits into its surroundings. So let's take a look at what an ecologist needs to know as we look at niches and community interactions. And what does Walter Payton have to do with all of this? Get your papers ready, wide right, skinny left, and I will see you on the next slide. Okay, now on a football team each player has a specific role and a certain place on the field and a certain job to do during the game. Players have a range of conditions under which, which they operate or play. You only saw Walter Payton or Gail Sayers when the Bears had the ball and those two players usually had the ball. And you won't ever see Case Keenum on the defense trying to stop the other guys. Well, the same is true in the biological world. Everything has a place and everything has a specific job and everything is in its place doing its certain job. Each species has a range of conditions in which it can grow and reproduce, in which it can thrive. Much like each player has a range of conditions in which they play. This is a part of an organism's niche. So let's, let's talk a little bit more about this niche business. In order to understand what a niche is all about, you also need to think about another word, and that word is tolerance. One definition of the word tolerance is the act or capacity of enduring. In biological terms, it is the ability to survive and reproduce in a range of conditions. When conditions are not optimal for growth and fitness, an organism becomes stressed and it expends a great amount of energy just trying to maintain homeostasis. Imagine how hard your body would work to keep you warm if you are outside in freezing temperatures wearing summertime clothes. You would be excuse me, you would be at one of the lower levels of your tolerance and growth and reproduction is not high on the list of favorites right then. Just getting and staying warm would be. So as you study this graph you can kind of see where tolerance is important. Now, habitat, habitat, have to have a habitat, 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 have to have a habitat. Yeah, that was a song that we used to sing when I taught elementary school. Raise your hand if you ever listened to it or sang it. That was one of my favorites. Everything has to have a habitat. A moose in the coniferous forest has to have a habitat. A raccoon in the deciduous forest has to have a habitat. Or a chinchilla in the cold Atacama Desert has to have a habitat. A habitat is the general place where an organism lives and an organism's tolerance helps determine its habitat. Simply put, the conditions it can withstand determine where it lives. Makes sense, doesn't it? Does to me. Habitat, habitat, have to have a habitat, 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 have to have a habitat. Mm, I gotta go find that song now. But describing a species address only tells part of the story. Ecologists also study a species ecological occupation, and that's in quotes, where and how it makes its living. These are all parts of the idea of an organism's niche. J.J. Watt is not just a football player in Houston. His occupation is more than that. He goes and talks to people, he makes appearances, he's a son, got a mom and dad. So kind of keep that in mind as we look at the biological aspect of niche. The definition of niche is the range of physical and biological conditions in which a species lives and the way that species obtains what it needs to survive and reproduce. 
Okay, Ms. Osterman, you talk too fast. Okay, in simpler terms, a niche is the ecosystem in which an organism lives and the way it obtains resources. Resources are any necessity of life, including both physical or abiotic aspects like sunlight, humidity, temperature, and biological or biotic aspects like the way it reproduces or whether it's predator or prey and the way it obtains its food. Okay, so the niche is the range of physical and biological conditions that an organism lives in and the way it gets its resources. If you look at any community, there are endless examples of organisms attempting to use various essential resources. When organisms attempt to use the same limited ecological resource in the same place at the same time, competition occurs. Kind of like everybody grabbing for the last hamburger on the dinner table. Plants compete for light, water, and nutrients in a forest. Some develop widespread shallow root systems to grab surface water quickly, while others develop long tap roots to get to deep stores of water underground. Leaf size and shape are determined by the ability to collect light energy. Animals compete for resources such as food, mates, and living space. Competition can occur between members of the same species or between members of different species. Direct competition between different species almost always results in a winner and a loser, with the losing, losing species usually dying out. Observing this phenomena led biologists to the, to the discovery of the competitive exclusion principle. Consider a hawk and an owl in this picture. They, sh they live in the same habitat and their food chains overlap quite a bit. So how do they survive if they can't be in the same niche at the same time competing for the same resources? Easy. They've adapted. The hawk hunts during the daytime and the owl hunts at night. So species adapt or die out. That's a law that Darwin developed which we will talk more about later. One way species adapt is to divide resources rather than compete for them. The owl and the hawk are one example of this. Another well-documented example of different species is that of a little songbird that lives in North America, the warbler. There are five species that all compete for nesting space and food in the same kind of trees. But rather than compete, each has a habitat in a specific part of the tree, thereby avoiding competition and ensuring the survival of all the species. If you think about it, there are examples of this even in everyday life. Do the Manning brothers both play for the same team? No, there's not room for both of them on the same team. So instead of competing, species divide resources. This helps determine the number and the kinds of species and the respective niches that they all have. Because they are not primary producers, virtually all animals must eat other organisms, whether plant or animal. These relationships are important in shaping communities. Predation affects the size of the prey population and also the places where the prey can live and feed. Owls and other birds of prey are important in regulating the rodent population, like you see here. And where the owls live determines where the rodents live. They usually try to stay away from them. So predators affect the size of prey population and the places that prey can live and feed. Swarms of locusts are well known for destroying large areas of vegetation, as you see here. Herbivores also then affect their community. They can affect the size and distribution of plant populations and the places that some plants can grow and survive. Another very, very important part of every community is the keystone species. This is a species that, 
when eliminated or almost eliminated from a community causes drastic changes and a tremendous change in the equilibrium or homeostasis of the community. Examples of this are the sea otter, which you see here, or the carnivorous sea star called Pisaster. Pisaster. <coughs> Those are both keystone species. In engineering terms, a keystone is a wedge-shaped piece at the crown of an arch that locks or holds all the other pieces into place. If you remove it, the arch falls apart. So it's easy to see why ecologists, one, figured out that the otter and the sea star were keystone species, but it's also easy to see why ecologists spent a great deal of time identifying and understanding what these keystone species do and why they're important to the community. Now, aside from predation and herbivory, there are three ways in which organisms depend on each other. Okay? In predation, one organism eats another, but they don't depend on each other. And the same with herbivory. So we're going to look at these three examples of interdependence. This is called symbiosis. Symbiosis is when at least one organism benefits in the relationship. Okay? The two species live closely together and at least one benefits. There's a lot of examples of species living closely together, but they don't affect each other. Okay? That's not symbiosis. Symbiosis is where one of them at least benefits. So let's take a look at them. The first one is mutualism. Mutualism is when both organisms benefit. Okay? If I were looking at this as a math problem, I'd see a plus and a plus. They both get something out of the deal. One common example is the sea anemone and the clownfish. Yep, the little Nemo. The clownfish is immune to the stinging cells on the sea anemone's tentacles and it's protected from predators. So if it, if it has a fish chasing it, it goes and hides in the anemone and it's protected. Now that lures a fish toward the anemone and the anemone might be able to catch it and eat it. The clownfish also chases away attackers from the anemone who might want to nibble on the juicy looking tentacles. So the clownfish benefits because it's protected and the anemone benefits because it's protected and it also gets some, some fish lured, lured toward it so it can eat. The next relationship is the one you guys probably know and that's parasitism. One organism benefits and one is harmed. An example of this is mosquitoes. Yes, mosquitoes are parasites on us. They get a good blood meal from us while we get a nasty bite. And sometimes we might get a disease from them, but that's just because the mosquito is carrying the disease, not because the mosquito wanted to make us sick. One misconception about parasitism is that the parasite's goal is to kill the host. This really isn't true. If you think about it, that wouldn't be a good thing for the parasite because it would lose its source of food. The host sometimes does die, but the parasite moves on finding another host. Its goal is not that of a predator. Its goal is just to get something to eat. Lastly, we have commensalism. In this relationship, one species benefits, but the other is not harmed nor helped. Okay? Barnacles are a small marine animal that are similar to coral with a little shell built around them. Barnacle colonies are often found growing on the nose of large marine mammals like whales. The whales aren't harmed, nor, they hurt, nor, nor do the barnacles do anything to help them. Okay? So they're not hurt and they're not helped. But the barnacles are helped by the whale a great deal because the whales are constantly swimming around. So the barnacles, because they feed on plankton, they have the water source constantly moving over and around them with plankton constantly falling into their mouths. So it's perfect for the barnacles. Okay, I'm not sure if this is an example of competition or predation or parasitism or what, but I thought it was funny and now I've got the Kung Fu fighting song going through my head. 